Welcome home. Those in the house, those online, I want to invite you to take that connect card that you received on the way in. If you're in the house, begin to fill it out. We want to connect with you. That's the best way we know how to connect with you. We want to come alongside of you and pray. That's the best way we know how to know how to pray is by you taking a moment and just completing that connect card. And if you're in the house, there's a QR code. You can scan that seat in front of you and fill out the digital card. If you'd rather fill out a digital card, if you're online with us, there's a link dropped in the comment section and, uh, and you can just take a moment and we take a moment, and just complete that connect card. We want to connect with, with you. Matthew chapter six, Matthew chapter six. Last week we we began Matthew chapter 6 uh, with the how-tos. It was all about the, the how-tos, how to give. Jesus teaches us how to give, how to pray. He teaches how to forgive, how to fast. Uh, and then today we're going to look at, beginning in verse 19, we're going to look at God in, in possessions. And then uh, and then the cure for anxiety. And I believe that Jesus teaches us the cure for anxiety. That's what we're going to press in hard. And so I hope you have your Bibles and you'll turn to Matthew chapter 6. If you don't have a printed copy of God's Word, we have some in the back. We'd love for you to, to take one and to begin to read it uh, and to, to follow along, dive into this rich text. Jesus is teaching the best sermon ever from the Sermon on the Mount, right on the side of the mountain. Uh, overlooking Sea of Galilee, beautiful sight. Jesus is teaching the disciples. He's instructing the disciples. He's gathered a few of them that were fishing. And he said, come on, follow me. And for the rest of your lives, you're going to fish for, for men. That's going to be the call in your life. And of course, they didn't stop fishing. We see that in the Gospels. So there's, there's hope and for you fishermen. They're like, I got to give up fishing now. Uh, th these guys didn't. Uh, it was just uh, their, their, their perspective, their call shifted for sure. Their vocation shifted for sure as they uh, followed in obedience to the Lord Jesus. And so Jesus teaches us the cure for anxiety. Let's dive right into the text. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so Jesus, as he has already done, we've already read, we've already seen, hopefully you've been applying Jesus cuts right to the chase and he says, don't store up for yourself treasures here on earth. Did you know that 90% of worldwide self-storage inventory is in America? Uh, the, the question used to be, what are they building on US-1? Well, we know the answer now. You don't got to ask nobody. It's another self-storage unit. Like, we need one more. I don't know. Uh, but but uh, that's, 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 that's something else. 38% of Americans are self-storage users. And uh, by the way, if you have a self-storage, well, buckle up. I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, and we're going in hard uh, here. Americans, listen to this. Spend. This was staggering when I read this. Americans spend $44.3 billion a year on self-storage. Some, some of y'all need to run to that thing as soon as this is over or, or after the serve project and, uh, and go close that account and I don't move it in with somebody. I don't know. But uh, $44.3 billion a year right here in America is used to, to, to store st stuff? To store stuff? It's crazy. Don't store up, Jesus says. Don't store up for yourselves. If you wonder where I stand on self-storage units, well, I can't. I, we, anyways, Jesus says this. Here's the literal translation. Do not treasure for yourself treasures on earth. Do not treasure for yourself treasures on, on earth. He says, don't store up for yourself treasures all on, on earth. Listen, earthly treasure is temporary and fading, right? Anyone that's ever experienced a Christmas knows that to be true. You, I mean, you are 
amped out of your minds, right? Parents, you've been planning all year. Some of you planning, you know, a week. And, uh, and that's cool too. And, and, and you get the, the thing that your child has been after, man. And, and then you, you, you see their, their eyes light up on Christmas Day. And, and then what happens like a week later, right? Uh, well, after you get through it, it needs batteries, right? The week later, you're like, what happened to the thing? Uh, you know, it worked perfectly on Christmas Day. Uh, everything in this life is prone to destruction. Jesus himself, he said it, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and, uh, and, and steal. And so earthly treasure, we understand this, is temporary and fading. Heavenly treasure, Jesus says, is secure. Heavenly treasure is is secure. The issue isn't that earthly treasures are bad. That's, that's really not the, the issue. The issue is that we just have too much stuff. That's really the issue. It's not that the stuff necessarily is bad. We are called to steward well the stuff that we've been entrusted, that's been entrusted to us. And so uh, earthly uh, treasure isn't necessarily bad. It's what are we doing with the earthly treasures? What are we doing with this earthly treasures? Uh, psychologists will say that clutter, you know, having too much stuff, uh, clutter increases cortisone levels. And cortisone, what is that? Cortisone levels the stress hormone inside of you. And so no wonder when you uh, walk into a, a home or a room uh, it, or a storage unit or a garage and you just see a whole bunch of stuff inside of you begins to well up. Well, here you go. This is why clutter increases uh, the cortisone levels. And, uh, and so uh, I don't know what you're about to walk into later today, but I'll just put that out there. Uh, oftentimes we say, no, nope, not today, and close that door and save it for another day. Why? Because we, we don't want to be more overwhelmed. Uh, we don't want the anxiety within us. Clutter creates this visual noise. It creates mental chaos. And what does all that lead to? It leads to feeling overwhelmed and, and, and anxious. And uh, as we consider stuff. You know, the secret to happiness, to life, to peace, so many, I mean, we're after that, right? You want that. You want that. And so this is why you get in that relationship and why you go to school or go to trade school or just learn from somebody and you do something with your life. And we're, we're after what's the secret to life, you know, secret life. And in our minds, we've been taught it's, it's, it's stuff, it's, it's, this person has it, so I got to get after it, right? I got to kind of compete, if you will. And that's not the secret of life. The secret of life, listen, if you don't hear anything else today, the secret of life is contentment. I, I want you to hear clearly, the secret of life is not more stuff. I, I mean, when, when you're feeling a little overwhelmed, a little anxious, I don't know if it's you, I know some, and you go shopping because it makes you feel better. And you don't need to go shopping. I mean, you don't need the other thing necessarily, but you, you, it's releasing something. It's filling a void, right? And we're going to talk about that in a moment. And so what do we do? We gather more stuff, right? We gather more stuff. Uh, most people do this of some kind of sort of shopping, whether it's clothes or things or food or whatever it might be. And we feel better for a moment until we wake up and realize that, nah, the, the thing is still there. I got to deal with this thing, whatever it is. And, and so the secret of life is not more stuff. Listen, the secret of life is contentment. First Timothy chapter six, would you write this reference down? First Timothy chapter six, older Paul is teaching a younger Timothy. He's instructing a younger Timothy. In verse six, he says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. What's the great gain? First, godliness, becoming more like him, becoming more like God, the growth in your life to be more like him. Godliness, and then he says this, with what? Contentment, all right, you're there. Okay, I'll get you there. The contentment, it was like this awkward pause. Uh, contentment is the fill in the blank, right? Godliness with contentment is great gain. You want great gain? You want gains that will last? Hey, seek after godliness 
and grow in your contentment. Grow in your contentment. The secret of life is not more stuff. The secret of life is, is contentment. And this is what we're going to see Jesus is teaching in Matthew 6. We're going to see it come full circle. We're going to see it all come uh, together. Verse 7, 1 Timothy 6, verse 7 says, For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. We brought nothing in. Listen, we can take nothing, we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we will be what? Thank you, thank you. Not awkward pause. We will be, we will be con content. We will be content with these. Verse 9, but those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. I mean, Paul, he's just, he's just shooting it straight at Timothy. Older Paul, seen some things, pouring into a younger Timothy, and he sends this message to beware. And isn't that message just like constantly in our face? The ri quick, quick, rich, you know, gimmicks uh, that um, some of us have fallen into traps, you know? Uh, if you just do this, you'll, you'll make all this money. I would always be leery of that, by the way. Always be leery. Use, use wisdom. And so Paul says, he says, but those who want to be rich... What's the priority of your life? Is it wealth? Is that the number one priority of your life? Is it riches? Is it more possessions? Be, be, be weary. He says, those who want to be rich fall into temptation. A trap. Many foolish, harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. Beware of the destruction. I mean, we can do a whole lot of things with possessions and if they're used for the glory of God, then it will lead to, to life, guaranteed. But if we don't use all of this stuff for the glory of God, it leads to, to destruction. Verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This is one of the most misquoted scriptures of all times, right? You, you hear people try to say, ah, money is the love of Money is the uh, uh, root of all kinds of evil. Uh, no, the scripture says the, the love of money. The love of money. It's what are we doing with it? All that we have in this life is a gift from God. And you and I are called to steward all that he's gifted to us. And so what are we doing with the wealth? What are we doing with the possessions that God has gifted to us? And when I say gifted, I'm, I want to constantly remind myself, remind my, my family that everything that we have is given from God because he owns it all. He owns it all. Well, you say, man, I, I got up and went, went to work yesterday. You know, I, wor I, I, worked, I worked my tail off yesterday. You only got up and worked your tail off or not uh, because God gave you breath to get up. You're not getting up apart from the breath of God. And so you better take a step back and realize that unless God gives you that breath and he gives you the strength and he gives you the wisdom and he gives you the discernment and he gives you those gifts, you ain't working for nothing. It's all because of him that he's graciously given to us. And so the real question is, the love of money. What's the priority of your life? What's the priority of my life? What's the, the focus? What's the focus? Back to the text. Uh, Jesus does not say. He does not say it, it is wrong to possess earthly treasures. He does, he does say it is wrong to lay it up. Do you see that? Lay to lay it up for, for self. Again, we are to hold everything as stewards. Everything that we have. It's been entrusted to us. You've heard it said, uh, you've heard it said a moving truck full of possessions never follows a hearse. You heard that? A moving truck loaded up with all the stuff never follows a hearse. Why? Because we can't take anything with us. Everything we might take to the next life is left behind. Interesting enough, if you, any, any historians out there, uh, the pharaohs of Egypt were buried with were buried with gold and treasures. And why were they buried with gold and treasures? 
in order to take it into the afterlife, to take this gold and to take the treasures in. And, and if you dig uh, up any of these graves, what you're going to find are bones and, and the treasures. You're going to find the bones and the gold and treasures. None of it, none of it goes. Our material treasures will not pass from this life to the next. But listen, the good the good that has been done for the kingdom of God through the use of our treasures lasts for eternity and, and the work, don't miss this, the work God does in us and the work that he does through faithful giving will last for all eternity. You never know the impact of someone's life. Proverbs tells us giving gifts opens doors. And it's always interesting. It's always interesting to me. How far just a little bit of kindness goes. That when we're kind to people, walls come down, hearts are softened. So then we can share the greatest gift that will last for all eternity. That is salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. Amen. Verse 21. Where your treasure is there, your heart will also be. There where your treasure is. And so I, I want you to think about this, that our treasure equals our heart. Treasure equals, equals our, our, our heart. And, and as we think about this, consider the questions. What do you think about the most? What, what, what has your attention? What has the priority of your life? What, what has your heart? I mean, what is your focus in, in life? What's the first thing you think of when you wake up? What's the last thing you think of when you go to sleep? What's the thing you think about the most all throughout the day? And that will tell, that will tell where your heart lies. The truth about who you really are. Look to verse 22, verse 23, often a, uh, two verses that kind of skipped right over. But we're not going to do that. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that, that darkness? And some of y'all like, both my eyes are bad, but hold on. Okay? Jeez, there's, there's much more. Jesus really talking about our physical, our physical eyes here. The idea, the idea behind having a good eye uh, equates to uh, generosity. Generosity. Being generous brings light into our lives as, as, we're, as we're generous, as we're a generous people. Being generous brings light into our lives. We are more content when we have God's heart of generosity. I, I often tell people when, man, when you, when you feel down, when you feel discouraged, when you feel defeated, when, when you need to pick me up, Go grab a coffee and, and, then, and then go do something kind for somebody. Right? Go serve somebody. Go love somebody. Go, go, go give somebody something. I, I mean, the, the, the endorphins that release within us when we consider others, it's how God designed our bodies to be. It's always amazed me that when we serve others and put others before our, ourselves, that's when we feel like alive. So if you're feeling dead today, you're dragging today. Well, you picked a, a good week to be here because we're not shy on opportunities to serve people. And so I would encourage you, if you haven't already, jump in on one of these projects that's happening throughout, throughout this week and be generous. Jesus refers to the, the evil eye. The evil eye was a phrase among ancient Jews. Don't, don't miss this. And, and it was a phrase among uh, ancient Jews to denote an envious or a greedy man. And so if they used this language, they were talking about, man, that person, nah, that person's not thinking about others, is thinking about him, himself. That's the evil eye. Uh, um, a, a man who looked at his neighbor's prosperity. You've never done that, right? Loved his own money. You've never done that. And would do nothing in the way of charity for, 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 God's, for God's sake. That's an evil. That's the evil eye. You know, oftentimes we, too, we, 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 we justify our, our sin. We justify our sin by saying things like, it's just one area of my life. God, you could have it all except this one area. <laughs> you know, and in and, 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 and reality, he, he is worthy of it all. Uh, we would be foolish to give him everything but 
areas that we think uh, we can continue to hold on to because some way they'll benefit us. No, surrender it off. You're struggling in one area. You're holding on to one area. Perhaps it's the possessions. Would you surrender? God, you've entrusted. You've given me everything that I have. Help me to steward it well for your glory. Help me to be a, a generous person. And so are, are you generous or are you greedy? Answer that privately between you and the Lord. I mean, he already knows, but you know, answer it. Are you generous or are you greedy? The early church, Acts chapter 2, verse 45. Just write that reference down. It's not on the screens. Acts chapter 2, verse 45. Uh, the early church were, were a generous people. They were a generous people. Verse 45 says, they sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. If someone had need, they were able to meet those needs. Why? Because they weren't just building up storage units, you know? Uh, they were able to meet these needs and steward well all that the Lord had entrusted to, to them. Look at verse 24. No one... No one can serve two masters since either he will hate one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus, I mean, cuts right at it. You can't serve both. You can try. And, and, and I, if I had to venture the majority of this room, the majority online, we've tried. We've tried to serve both, but Jesus says it is impossible. You cannot serve both God and and money. And so make the decision today who you will serve. Don't delay. Don't delay. Make the decision today who you will serve. See, ancient Israel struggled with idolatry and, and those that Jesus is talking to that day would have known. And as if you've studied the Old Testament, you know. I, I mean, they were in captivity in Egypt, and the Lord released them, freed them, and uh, they're wandering around the wilderness for 40 years, and it's like at one moment, praise God, we're free, praise God, you're my provider, then the next moment, it's like they've turned their backs on God. When things get difficult, they begin to question God, God, where are you? But when things are good, it's all good, and, and so Ancient Israel struggled with idolatry. They would build these false gods. You've heard of the God of Baal. They would build this statue. They would pray and worship. And so God throughout the Old Testament would send these prophets, these men of God, called by God to speak to the people of God, to call these people back to God. Walk away from these idolatries. Serve the one true and living God. I would encourage us today to be careful those moments uh, when we're feeling overwhelmed and, and, and we're feeling discouraged. Anxiety is building up within us. I would encourage you, run to the Lord. Don't, don't delay. Don't walk. Don't skip. Run to him. Something happens in those, in, in the times of decisions that we have to make. And if we're not careful, the enemy's coming in. He's seeking, it's like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He wants nothing but destruction for your, your life. And so run to, to the Lord in those moments of despair. Look to 25, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. Last time you just pause and listen to the birds. When was that, when was that time? Last time you just pause. Consider the birds of the sky. They, they don't sow or reap or gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one more, uh, one moment to his lifespan by worrying, look, look back to 25, therefore. He says all this about uh, possessions and wealth and money. And then he says the word, therefore. He's about to tie it all together. After everything that was just stated, Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, don't worry. Why? Because it seems that the more stuff we have, the more we have to worry about. And Jesus says, don't 
worry about your life. Verse 27, look at this question. Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? What a question to consider. I love that when Jesus taught through the gospels, so often he would ask questions to allow the people to answer, to, to allow them to think without just giving them the answer. Consider this question. Verse 27, can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? Now, if we're honest people, which I hope you are, uh, at least majority of you, I hope, you know, I hope everybody is, is uh, if we're honest, we've all found ourselves in this place of worry. We've all found ourselves in from time to time worrying. And if you're honest, uh, it has profited nothing but, but your body, the damage that takes place within you by worrying rather than choosing to worship and worrying rather than choosing to, to pray, to trust God, to consider all that he's given us, to allow a brother or sister to come alongside of you and help with your perspective to be put back on the Lord, our, our God. And so Jesus asked this question, can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by, by worrying? Quickly, uh, four, four things researchers want you to know about stress from the APA, the American Psychological Association. First one, stress can manifest in the body. Uh, most of us, if we've ever been stressed, you, you feel it, you feel something different. You're like, I don't know, I'm about to fall over, <laughs> or whatever, the, wherever. Stress can, can manifest with, within our body. It's not always the external. We have to be careful. We have to be careful that when stress begins to uh, 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 build within us, we quickly go to, to the Lord rather than allow the stress to control us. Uh, it's possible that sometimes you say the things you do. That you say the things you say and you do the things you do because you're stressed. Um, even, this, even this past weekend, it was a long week, man. A long week. And, uh, and I had to catch myself a couple times of saying things that are not a, a, of the Lord or that could be hurtful to the people closest to me, my family. And uh, you know, the best decision I made was to go take a nap. <laughs> And so uh, some of y'all, when you're feeling that stress on, you, you need to go take a nap. Don't say one more word. Just go take a nap, all right? That's the first. Second, quickly, uh, physical effects of stress can be damaging even when you appear fine on the outside, right? You kind of like make, a, make it all up. Make, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you know, you can make yourself look really good and uh, it's all good. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. You ever say that? I'm fine. And it's like inside you're not fine. And so you need to be honest. You, you need to be honest. Physical effects of stress can be, can be damaging even when you appear fine on the outside. We need help. We need help. Third, effects don't end when the stressful experience ends. Oftentimes we think, oh, praise God, it's over. But there's lingering effects. And so we need to, we, there, there's time, we need to continue to pray about that thing. We, we need to continue to, to forgive that person. We need to continue to go deeper in, 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 the, in the word of God. We need to continue to have that accountability person, brother, sister, come alongside of us, listen and help guide us because there's, there's lingering effects. And, and then the fourth is this, research. And I love this. They didn't know they were right to the church. The fourth is this, social support is good for everyone. What does that mean? Hey, we need community. You need community more than you think you need community. And if you think like, I, no, I'm good. I'm just an introvert. No, listen, introvert, you need community. Doesn't mean you have to say anything, <laughs> but you need to sit in a room with somebody and allow someone to show you the love of Jesus, pray for you, hear you, to be present. You need it. We need community more than we know we need community. That's why we encourage you. Join a group. Meet in a home, in a coffee shop, wherever these groups are meeting. Whole list in our next step area. Join a group. We need community. This idea of just coming in for the hour, leaving, running out. No, that's not church. Maybe that's how you grew up, but you grew up wrong. No, we need, we need each other. God designed us for community, one another. That we can, I need someone to call me out. Even though I don't like it, I still need it. We need each other. Listen to what the, the research says on this. Strong social bonds can protect against stress-related physical and mental illnesses. 
like heart disease and depression. Listen to this. Cutting your risk of early death by 50%. That was, I was like staggering when I read that. We need, we need community. Let's continue. He's going to be playing the keys for a little while. And while, verse 28, love you, Micah. Kind of like it, soothing. And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you? Do do you hear how much God cares for you? We were created in his image. If someone hasn't told you that your life matters, it does. If someone hasn't told you lately that you're valuable, you are valuable. There's purpose. You are loved by God created. He doesn't waste junk. He has a plan for you. He says, you have little faith. Calls out those disciples quickly. Verse 31, so don't worry. Here again, don't worry. Saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. All the questions, all the concerns, all the needs. They're, they're always after it. It's always at the forefront of their minds. They're stressing out, always stressing out about all these things. He says, And your heavenly father knows that you need them. Your heavenly father knows. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. What is our only proper response when we are feeling weighed down by the world, stressed out of our minds? What is our only proper response? It's here. You don't have to go further. You don't got to go buy a self-help book even. It's right here. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. All these things. First Peter chapter five, verse seven says this, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. He cares about you. Whatever it is, whatever care, whatever burden, whatever anxiety, cast it on him. He's big enough. (laughs) Cast it on him. Knowing that he cares. No one cares like creator God. He cares for you. Did you see, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If you recall last week, Jesus gave us the model prayer in chapter six, earlier in chapter six. And how did he teach us to pray? Our father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's it's acknowledging his kingdom first. It's acknowledging his will be done. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What or who are you seeking after today? Would you just be brutally honest? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. All these things. So Jesus teaches us. If we could walk away today with the secret of life, once again, I would say that it is about contentment. What God has given us, what will we do with it? The most content people that I know are stewarding well all that God has entrusted to them. I was meeting with a young couple that I'm marrying this week. And I encourage them in this 10, 10, 80 principle. It's a principle that Audrey and I have lived by for uh, uh, our marriage. And it's a principle that not only has changed us, but has changed many uh, people in our lives. And the 10, 10, 80 principle is this simple. A lot of times we overcomplicate a lot of things and I'm not a complicated guy. <laughs> no, I'm not a smart 10, 10, 80 is this. The first 10 represents the the tithe that me and my family, everything that comes into any of our bank accounts, we're going to give it to the Lord and we're going to honor him and we're going to trust him. And why do we do this? We do this because that first 10 helps Audra and I. It helps us 
keep the Lord the first priority in our lives and in our marriage and in our home and for our children. And I don't do it just because I'm the pastor and I should. Because first and foremost, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. The second 10, the second 10 is we save it. We're we're in a situation. I have many conversations with people that are struggling financially. And and it always comes back to, to, well, quite often it comes back to this, that we're spending far more than what we're bringing in. And so we can never get ahead. There's some good principles out there. I'd encourage you to start with a thousand dollar emergency fund because everybody knows something's going to break, right? That thing is breaking. Even if it's brand new, it's breaking. Even if you you got a deductible or whatever it is, have the cash. That's a good principle. But if you don't start working, how do I get there? Start this week. You take that second 10, you take 10% and you put it away and you don't touch it. Even when you think, oh, we're good. No, you're not. Something's going to happen be a good steward. And then you got the 80. Man, you got the 80 to pray through. Lord, how, how, how do I spend this money? Well, you got bills, right? And so start there. Uh, we have help, by the way, at wearediscovery.com. Go on the website, click under the resource tab. There's a financial help. There's a PDF that you can print and you can fill that out. Work together. If you're married, work together. If you're not, get somebody else to come alongside of you. Ask some hard questions. Make sure that you're on the right track. But we want to help you as a church be the best steward of all that the Lord has entrusted to you. Look to verse 34 and we close. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus already told us not to worry. He already told us he cares for us. He already asked the question, can worrying add anything else to our life? There are are, are people, and some maybe even here today, that are already worrying about the next thing. You're already worrying about tomorrow, and you don't even know. You don't know all the details. You don't have all the, you you don't have everything to, to make a wise decision. You're just worried. And Jesus tells us, stop. Stop worrying. Don't, don't, don't worry. Philippians chapter four, verse six. Paul's writing to the church in Philippi. He says this, don't worry. Just repeating Jesus. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. What is it? What's weighing you down, man? What's the decision on your heart? What's the decision before you? Don't worry. Pray. Pray through it. Don't worry. Worship. Worship through it. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is what this is what we get. This is what we receive when we don't worry and we choose to worship with thanksgiving. We present the request to God. We get the peace of God. And at the end of the day, guaranteed that's that's what your heart desires most. That's why you keep buying the things that you're buying. That's why you keep going from one relationship to the next because you're seeking something to fulfill the missing part inside of you that can only be fulfilled by the Lord Jesus. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says this, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Isn't that what we want? Rest, peace. Jesus says, will you come to me? Will you come to me? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place? Can I encourage you? As we pray, as we sing this final song and respond, can I encourage you to come to Jesus and find rest? See, see, we all have our different, we all have our different vices, if you will. 
We all have our different reactions when we're feeling stressed or feeling overwhelmed. And again, as I said earlier, it's that's only temporary. And Jesus says, you can't serve both God and, and money. As so today, would you would you come to him with whatever you're holding on to and would you release it into his capable hands? As people are praying all across this place online with us, you're praying, Lord, what is my response? What am I holding on to? What is my response? I wonder if there's one here that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus and today would be the day of salvation. As people are praying all across this place, maybe there's one here in the house or online that's never surrendered over to Jesus and today would be the day. Today would be the day that you confess that Jesus is Lord, that you're boss, that you're master starting this day. I'm no longer the boss of my life. You are. I submit, surrender to you. Have your way in my life. And then would you believe that he's Lord? Would you believe that Jesus came and died on a cross and was buried in a grave and rose victorious for the sins of the world? Would you believe that? Would you believe that? Would you tell him, I believe, I believe. Save me, set me free. Fill me up with the hope. I'll follow you all the days of my life. If you're in the house, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand, and there's going to be men and women at the different corners of this room. If you're online, there's a host. There's a host if you're online, and we would love to pray with you. Whatever's going on in your life, whatever you're struggling with, we would love to come alongside of you and pray with you. I don't know what your next step is, but I want to encourage you to take it. Don't delay. Is your next step, what is it? Salvation is renewal to follow Christ, recommit to, to him and him alone. Surrender over that thing that you're holding on to. Whatever it might be, would you move as, as the Spirit of God leads you to move today? Would you stand to your feet? And let's sing this song. Let's move as the Spirit of God leads us to move. Take courage. Trust Him.